Well, good morning. It's my pleasure to be here. I always, I was here last year and I'm, I'm here again, but I'll say the same thing as I did last year. I always enjoy coming back um, to Arkansas. I spent about seven years of my life in Arkansas and, and met my wife in Arkansas. My wife's a native Arkansan, so I um, always enjoy coming back and, and talking with producers here and I hope that I can bring a bit of a different perspective being that I'm in West Texas. Obviously it's a, a very different environment. Um, obviously we're primarily feeder cattle out there so you guys send your calves to us and that's kind of the focus of my talk today. It's centered around castration but castration is a very big issue with calves that we receive in our feedlots. And um, I've got some data that I'll share with you and, and hopefully show you why. But I would like to, to try to keep my talk as relevant as possible to the cow-calf operation because I'm sure that's what most of you guys are cow-calf producers, maybe some stalker producers as well. But. Okay, so just to give you an overview of the presentation, I'm going to start out with three thoughts. Three thoughts on castration that I have before I ever go into data and talking about data. We'll talk about some of the current industry practices around castration. And then we'll talk about castration methods, the timing of castration, and why are bulls discounted at the sale barn? And talk about some reasons why. And then finally end up with the question, should you castrate your bull calves or should you not? Okay. There we go. So here is a slide with kind of an overview of the research that I have used to develop this talk. I'm not going to present a bunch of p-values and standard errors to you. I'm just going to show you the means. I'm also going to talk about primarily performance, although in these studies we, we looked at a lot of other variables, but I'll mainly be talking about performance. But I'd like to point out that almost all of these studies, with the exception of, of one here, were either done with Arkansas cattle or in collaboration with Arkansas researchers. So I think it's very relevant um, to you guys and to your operation. Three thoughts. The longer the testicles stay attached to the animal, the more attached the animal becomes to their testicles. <laughs> if that's a funny way of saying it, but it's so true. If you remember one thing from today, the older that animal, the older that bull gets, the more stressful it is, the more, the more impactful the, the performance loss is on those older bulls. So the earlier, if you do castrate your animals, the earlier you castrate, the easier it is on the animal in general. In my opinion, the castration method doesn't really matter in young beef cattle. And I'm talking branding age or 90 days of age or less. It's really just a matter of preference. And you may have a preferred method, banding versus surgical are the two major ones that we'll talk about. But in that young of an animal, both methods do cause a little bit of stress in that young animal, but it's much easier on those younger animals, whether you band or, or surgically castrate. In the older animals, in weaning age calves or older, so about 200 days of age or older, personally, I prefer banding. 
and anytime you band, you should give a tetanus toxoid. So tetanus is probably the, the big drawback to banding. Um, it's rare, it doesn't happen very often, but I've seen it happen. In fact, I've got a video clip, if anybody's interested, of a calf that contracted tetanus after it was banded, and you don't want that to happen. So, and that tetanus tox only costs about a dollar, um, but it's well worth the investment. Okay, current industry practices. What are you guys, the cow-calf producers, how many of you are castrating your bull calves? This is a US, these are a series of USDA surveys, one in 1992, one in 1997, and one more recently in 2007, 2008. And you can see none, those are the basically the percentage or the proportion of bull calves coming to market, okay? The interesting thing to me is that it's relatively stayed the same, if not even increasing, as far as the number of bull calves coming to market. And so we're not changing our practices much over the years. And then this shows, okay, what do the feedlot, what does the feedlot do once they get the bull calves? Which method is preferred? And this is two different surveys, one from 1999, one from 2011. And the big take home from this is if you look at the numbers, banded 41%, surgically castrated 47%. There is very little consensus amongst the feed yards of what is the best, best method. And, and there's not a lot of data out there to really clarify that. So let's talk about some methods. And I should have warned you, but here's kind of a graphic picture, but that's the way it is, right? If we surgically castrate animals, we're surgically removing removing the testicles, and this is one method, surgical castration. And some, I've got some pros and cons listed for each of the methods. And with surgical, these are just my thoughts, but you know, it's complete removal. You know you've got the testicles removed, right? And it's an acute effect rather than a delayed effect. So, you know, you get, you get the testicles removed, it causes a lot of trauma, but hopefully they heal up and, and carry on and perform well. And I like calf fries. Does anybody eat calf fries? <laughs> so if you ban your cattle, you're not gonna get calf fries, so that's just kind of a bonus, but dogs like to eat them too. Um, some cons, of course, would be blood loss. Definitely, um, I've seen calves die from blood loss after castration, and we definitely don't want that. Also secondary infection, and so if, if you surgically castrate your calves in a, a day like today where it's really wet and they lay down in manure, they can definitely get a secondary infection, which is not as likely with a band. And for those of you that have done this, you know this is very labor intense, right? If you castrate a hundred head in a day, you are worn out. And so it's definitely labor intense, probably a little more than banding. So band castration, it's, to me, it's much faster to band versus surgical. Cause if you're surgically castrating, you need to be aseptic, be clean, take your time, make sure you're, you're doing everything correct. Once you get used to banding, it's, it's really quick. It's obviously cleaner. You don't have blood loss from the surgical procedure, but the effect of banding seems to be more spread out than <coughs> surgical. Surgical, it, it's really hard on the cattle for about a week and they, you lose performance. With banding, it's, it's spread out over two or three weeks where the performance loss is a little more gradual. 
And it's a little bit less labor intense in my mind to band versus surgical. I talked about tetanus and anytime you get band cattle, you definitely want to administer a tetanus toxoid. Um, a really popular one is Covexin 8. It's also a clostridial, but it's got tetanus toxoid in it. But there's a couple other options as well. Yes, sir. <coughs> That would work, yes. That's probably what you're talking about is that Covex and eight. So most black legs are seven way, right? The eight way adds that tetanus toxoid in it. Yeah. Um, banding costs money too, right? The bands aren't free. And I've got a breakdown of that of some different options here on the next slide, I think. So that would be a con. Misapplication, I'll say it's called a Mississippi implant since I'm at Arkansas. But does everybody know what a Mississippi implant is? Some, I'm sure this happens, but some producers intentionally will slip one of the testicles up above the band and just band one of them because they feel like by leaving that one in there, they're gonna get some testosterone production, some growth. Don't do that. But that can happen on accident too, right? Um, a lot of times it, it's hard to get both of them slipped down. Sometimes you think you got them both in and you let go of the band and one will slip up. And so that's definitely a con to banding. Okay, here are five different band options. And I'm going to talk through these um, real briefly. And then I've got a video that I'd like to show of each one that will demonstrate each type. But the first one's a California bander. And I know Don uses that quite a bit here. I really like the California bander because if you look at the cost, um, you know, the application tools, fairly inexpensive. The bands are quite, are half as much as the Calicrate, or less than half. And it's really quick and easy, we'll see on the video. The Tribander works well for younger cattle. Um, once cattle get up above probably four to 500 pounds, the Tribander is, the, the hole that it makes that you'll see is too small and it's really difficult to ban the older calves with the tribander. That easy castrator, has anybody used that one? That one, I don't like at all. It's really difficult to use. I don't have a video for that one. Um, the calicrate, I'm sure someone in here hopefully probably uses a calicrate. I like the calicrate. Um, it's a pretty expensive initial cost. And again, the bands are quite a bit more, but um, the calicrate's good. And then the little green bands, right? With the simple little tool and the small little green band, those will work pretty well for newborn calves. But once you get past a newborn age calf, they're really too small. Um, Don, you might help me out here. leave it there. So that's just a, a device that fits right in your hand. Um, pretty simple. And on the top of it there, there's a little groove where the bands that you get are have a little clip on them. You'll see there's the clip. So that's the key with the California is fit it between your, your two fingers and, and pull it tight. Back 
hand into the notch on the top of the clip and into the right hand corner. It's as simple as that. You're done. Uh, to release the clip, you tip the tool, flip forward, and the clip slips out. The groove. Make sure that the band is tight. If you can't get your finger in under the band once it's on, uh, you know you've got to tight it up. And it's evenly stretched. Here you have the California Badger in action. You can see how really simple it is. This Pretty fast. The next will be applied to the back. However you prefer. Okay, that's the California Bander. Probably show just one more, the, the Calicrate. The Tri-Bander is just, it's, it's a tool that, it's just a simple rubber ring and you slide it on there and you push down on a lever and it just spreads it out, kind of like the green band. But here's the California, or the Calicrate Bander. Little different of a contraption. And so that kit there is about, I think it was about $280. So it's a little more of an initial investment for this one. But there's a, a metal clip on it and it's key to put, there's a, it's, there's a little um, indention. It's key to put that down to where you crimp it. And this is the one that cranks and there's a, they don't point it out, but there's a little knob there right in front of his left hand that's a tension knob. And when it moves all the way back towards you, that indicates that the tension is right. And then once you have it tight, you've got to crimp it with a tool below there. He's crimping the band right there. And then you take a knife or a, a side cutter and cut it and you're done. Okay. So those are a couple different um, banding methods. Again, all of them work, but I like the California bander the best personally, just because the bands are much less expensive and you saw how fast that is once you get used to it. And so that's the one I prefer personally. Okay, so now that we know the different methods, what have we seen as far as performance in cattle? And unfortunately, there's probably some data out there, but from what we have done, we have looked at surgical versus banding only in, upon feedlot entry. Um, but you can look and see average daily gain. So how much the cattle gained every day from day zero to seven. So they were castrated on day zero, right? And the surgically castrated cattle actually lost a pound a day during that time. Whereas the banded cattle they didn't gain very well, but they at least gained a pound a day. So that surgical, surgical castration hit them pretty hard. Then if you look at from day seven to 14, the same cattle, the same methods, those surgically castrated cattle started to heal up and really started to compensate, right? So they gained 
quite about a pound more a day than the, the banded group during that time. But then if you look at overall average daily gain through the whole feeding period, essentially the same, right? Same performance, okay? There are some alternative methods as well. Some of you may have heard of immunocastration and um, the efficacy of this is questionable. There's no, really no product for cattle. Chemical castration is being looked at as an option. You've got administration may be difficult with this, but it, again, there's no product currently. Has anybody used a clamp, Berdizo clamp, where it's just a big clamp and you try to cross the spermatic cords? It works if you do it right, but I've, had, I've seen cattle that arrived at the feedlot, they looked exactly like bulls, but they, we found out later they were Berdizo clamped, and we, but we castrated them because we didn't know. And so there's probably issues with marketing there. If you Berdizo clamp your calves and, they, and those testicles haven't atrophied or shrunk up yet, the buyer's gonna think they're a bull, right? So that's an issue with the Berdizo. What about timing? We know the longer the testicles stay attached to the animal, the more the animal becomes attached to them. But we've looked in Arkansas cattle, both here at this station and in Fayetteville, different timing of castration. And so the very first study we did, we looked at birth versus weaning. Then I'll talk about one here that we did here and looked at branding versus weaning. And then finally birth versus feedlot entry. So birth versus weaning, if you look at the weaning weight of calves that were castrated at birth versus their bull cohorts that stayed intact all the way to weaning, the weaning weight was slightly greater for the bulls, but not much. You'll see a trend here. But then after we castrated the bulls at weaning and the steers had already been castrated at birth, those steers gained about a quarter pound of a day more than the bulls castrated at weaning over a 56 day period, okay? Branding versus weaning, that's the study we did here. Um, at weaning, the bulls left intact weighed about 412 pounds. The steers that were castrated at branding weighed quite a bit more. I don't think this was statistically different. We just didn't have a lot of numbers, but at least numerically, they weighed more than the bulls. Uh, and then this is relative to branding. So for 56 days after branding, what do you notice here? The steers gained about as well as the bulls. And so in that young of an animal, it does not impact in nearly as much as say a weaning age animal. And then finally, birth versus feedlot entry. Um, again, so from that study, here's weaning weights for steers castrated at birth versus bulls that stayed intact. These actually stayed intact all the way to feedlot arrival. And again, the, at least numerically, the steers were heavier than the bulls at weaning. Um, and then from feedlot entry to reimplant, that's the data I showed you earlier, but um, the steers gained about the same as the bulls. So in this study, the bulls never caught up with the steers that were castrated at birth all the way to the carcass, okay? Um, and here's, this, this is not for you, this is for me, because there's a lot of numbers here. But I, I wanted to put this in here to remind me that, so the hot carcass weight was greater for, um, the control, which is the, the steers, and then um, we also had a difference in the back fat thickness as well. So, why are our bulls discounted? Well, you've seen the data, right? You lose performance, but there's other reasons too. That buyer, we've talked about how labor intense this is. If you leave your bulls intact, that buyer is going to have to incur those labor costs, right? Bulls are also much more likely to become sick 
in the feedlot versus a steer. And we found that in a study we published here recently with a lot of cattle. The bulls were over three times more likely to become sick versus a steer. And then in more of a controlled study, we saw the same thing. Um, about 54% of the bulls were treated, 45% of the steers were treated for respiratory disease. Um, I mentioned that the performance loss, right? And so you're, you're paying for that, or the buyer is discounting you for that because they know they're gonna have performance loss if they buy your bulls. And we talked about that earlier. One thing to think about too is castration is, it's a welfare issue, right? I mean, it's, it's definitely painful for the animal. Banding is painful too, don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Banding is painful as well as surgical. And it's interesting, this is a consumer survey and two thirds of consumers said that they would vote to ban castration without the use of pain control, which is just a sign of the times we live in, right? And in all these studies, we looked at pain control as well. I'm not showing you that data today, but um, Long story short, the pain control we use seems, seems to work, at least somewhat. And then a third of them said that they would be willing to pay more for beef from cattle castrated using pain control. So this is something to keep in mind too. The feedlots are hearing this from the packers because the packers hear it from the retailers because the retailers hear it from the consumers and it just works its way down. If you're sitting at a sale barn and you have the choice to buy a bull from a steer, you, a steer that runs through that ring, you know that steer's been in the chute at least one time, right? And so you know that he may have had a vaccine or he may have been on a better nutritional program. And so those perceptions also play into the discount for bulls as well. <coughs> How much are bulls discounted? Barham and Troxel had a really good study that hopefully you guys have seen some of the results of that. But they found that it was about $6.27 per hundred weight. In my opinion, that is not nearly enough. Um, I think we should be discounting bulls a little bit more than that, but the market plays its way out. Probably because of metaphylaxis is why it's, it's not higher. It's really interesting to look at this graph though. We've got bulls here um, in the middle, right, with the diamond. Steers are the square at top, and then heifers. What do you notice about the bull price line as they get heavier? Eventually this line crosses and bulls are worth less than heifers at a heavier weight, right? Because we know that the heavier that bulls are, the harder it is on them to castrate them. And so a really interesting take home is that how many people in here thought that bulls are heavier than steers at weaning, right? We've all been told that. That's the dogma that's out there. We are not seeing that in the studies we have done because I think the testosterone production that occurs in intact bulls and the performance benefit that you get from that, it doesn't happen until probably 170, 180 days of age, when you really start to get a performance increase, and you're weaning them at 200, you would have to keep those bulls longer, right, to 250 days or even longer to really get that natural performance boost. But if you do that and you market heavy animals, you're gonna pay for it, right? So it's kind of a catch-22. Should you castrate your bull calves? I talked about the dogma just now. Um, there's lots of reasons why a lot of producers don't, and I understand that. Um, it's, it's labor intense. You've got to have good facilities. Um, I found this picture on the internet. It's pretty interesting, but it probably works, right? But it wouldn't be fun to try to get cattle into there, but. You know, 
Facilities are really important, right, for management. If you have run-down facilities, old facilities, it's not very fun to work cattle, right? And so it's really, I think, it's worth the investment to just bite the bullet and upgrade your facilities so that you can implement a lot of these management procedures. So a little bit of cowboy math, and we're almost done. $6 hunter weight discount. That's about $30 a head for a 500-pound five, animal. You can see, depending on how many bulls you're mar or steers you're marketing a year, either the premium or the discount, however you want to look at it, for those numbers of animals, right? So to have 10 bulls that you market a year, you've got to have 20 cows, right? Assuming a 50-50 split between bulls and heifers. If you got 20 cows, is it worth, I mean, $300? I see why why there's some hesitation to do it um, on the smaller operations. Now, as you get larger, obviously, if you get a 400 head cow herd, you're leaving at least $6,000 on the table every year. It's, prob it's definitely worth um, castrating the larger you, larger you are. So the more bull calves you have, the more it makes economic sense to castrate them. But the easy answer is, should I castrate my bulls? Absolutely yes. If you want what's best for the industry, what's best for those animals, the earlier you castrate, the better. You're gonna improve welfare. They're not gonna, they're not gonna tend to get sick nearly as much in the feedlot. There's always that premium there that'll at least pay for it. And it's definitely best for the industry that we market steers and not bulls. So I'll close again with the three thoughts. Um, the older they are, the harder it is on them. The younger calves, surgical or banned, to me it really doesn't matter. It's whatever you prefer. And then I, again, I like banding with that tetanus toxoid in the older cattle. With that, I don't know if we have time for questions, but I'd be glad to answer a couple if we do. Yes, sir. Well, one of the pieces you presented, I thought, Gabe, there's an advantage to, to, ban, uh, to castration at a particular age, but you just summed up and said it's, it's so small it doesn't really matter. Just get it done before you market them or... So, um...